what is a lie that we all say multiple times a week? There is a lie that we all tell multiple times a week. What is that lie? Everybody does it. I do it. We all do it. What? I'm fine. I'm fine. That is the lie that we all say multiple times a week. How are you? I'm fine. I'm not sure why that is. Probably it's because we're concerned that if we say we're not fine, what will the response be? Go to a local restaurant. How are you? May I take your order? I'm not doing well. Would you like fries with that? <clears throat> Maybe we feel that it's not safe to be honest. If I say how I really feel, maybe I will get fired. Maybe someone will look down on me. So we just kind of go along with the I'm fine thing, even though most of us, at least some of the time, are not fine. I just finished directing a week of St. Stephen's summer camp in South Carolina. As I said, I am tired. I'm depleted, actually. I forgot most of your names today at communion. So if I didn't say your name, there's actually someone I said the wrong name for. I apologize for that. That's one of the reasons why you're supposed to say your name when you go for communion, because you never know what the mental state of your priest is. The other reason is it's your presentation of yourself with the name you were given at your baptism. That's actually the more important reason. When I go for communion, obviously I know my name and and God knows my name, and I still say my name in the presence of God to reaffirm the name that I got when I was baptized. And summer camp is very confusing for me, actually. It is part inspiration, part depression, part fun, mixed in with some anxiety and joy, all wrapped into one complicated package that leaves me at the end with a lot of things to unpack in my brain. In the gospel lesson today, it's very short, and there are two takeaways from this. Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers, Simon and and Andrew, and then two more brothers, James and John. They were fishermen, He called them and said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus did not go to the finest rabbinical school to take the PhD candidates. He went to the shore to find the fishermen. And in this telling of the story, we don't even hear that they're bad fishermen. As we hear in other other recountings of this call, he goes and finds them and says, follow me. And they say, we've toiled all night, we've caught nothing. How can we possibly offer anything to you? We can't even get our trade done in the right way. But their response is they left their nets and they followed him. The other takeaway from this gospel lesson is the very last verse because it actually tells you the three legs of the church, the three legs that the church is supposed to be doing. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom in healing every disease and infirmity among the people. Teaching, preaching, healing. This is what we are supposed to be doing here. The teaching occurs hopefully right now. I'm sorry, the preaching, not the teaching. The preaching hopefully is occurring right now. It's a one-way imparting of information to you. Teaching occurs when there is dialogue. That's why it's important to go to Bible study. Goya, other ministries where there's two-way communication. I was talking to the kids at camp, and we were talking, among other things, about the Bible and why no one reads it. They said, "It's, it's so hard to understand this. I said, yes, of course it's hard to understand that. That's why you go and you hear a sermon. That's also why you should read a Bible that has notes in it to help you interpret what you're reading. It's also why we should go to Bible study with people who are educated in the Bible to be led and study and come to a better understanding of that. 
Father John offers a Bible study. I offer a Bible study for women during the academic year. And there are other online Orthodox and non-Orthodox Bible studies. And I'm sure other Bible studies around town. But we should go and we should study the Bible. As far as healing every disease and every infirmity among the people, perhaps the greatest disease with which we are inflicted, afflicted is that we don't feel it's safe to be truthful. So we all carry around these lies and these uncomfortable things inside of us because we don't really know what to do with them. If I had a headache or a fever or a runny nose or some sickness for a couple days, more than a couple days, I would go to my doctor, who's actually here today, and I say, who's part of our congregation, he's here all the time, he's part of our congregation, I'm thankful for that. <clears throat> and I would say, doctor, I'm sick. And if the doctor said, here's a lollipop, I hope you feel better. Then I would feel cheated. What kind of cure is that? And so when people come to the church and they say, I'm sick, if they actually have the nerve to say, I'm sick and I need some help, and we say, here, have a gyro, that will heal you. Let's put on some music and you can dance and that will heal you. That's like me going to the doctor and he says, here's a lollipop that's going to heal you. We know that doesn't work. And yet we seem to perpetuate that because when our kids especially come here, that's what we seem to offer them, dancing and basketball. And it doesn't really work. <clears throat> we were doing an activity the other day at camp where the participant had to ask for help in order to complete the task. It was virtually impossible to do without help. And yet this person wandered around aimlessly to the point where I said, what is wrong with you? Can you not figure out that this activity cannot be done without assistance from somebody else? And I thought, when, I, and when we were done, and I said, really, you took way too long to figure that out. I thought I was going to get the usual, <clears throat> um, well, I'm very self-reliant. I am uncomfortable asking others for help. And I was shocked when I heard the answer, I don't feel like I am worthy to ask someone for help. I don't feel like I'm worthy of someone else's love and concern. And that is a problem. And if people are truthful, there's probably a lot of people walking around with that problem. There's probably people in our church this morning who have that issue. And yet we're going to just keep saying, I'm fine. I'm fine. <clears throat> the Bible says in Luke 11, verse 11 to 13, what father among you if his son asks for a fish will instead of a fish give him a serpent, or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion. Even Jesus tells us that lying and giving the wrong thing is wrong. So I'm left with these thoughts that I want to share with you. I feel motivated, and I will feel more motivated after I rest a little bit. I feel more motivated to deal with this question. How to get people to be truthful, and how we as a church are supposed to minister to people so that they feel comfortable feeling truthful. I won't ask you when you come up for Andido on how you're doing, because if you say, I'm not well, there's 100 people behind you in line. I can't deal with that today. I will, I will say it's wonderful to see you. That is truth. But when I ask the question, how are you, I really would like to know the answer. And if it's not well, if it's not fine, that's my job, my ministry as a priest, to help minister to you in the moments when you're not fine. If everyone comes to the church and says, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, not only there's nothing for me to do, but there's nothing for you to gain by being here. Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, only those who are sick. And the church exists as a spiritual hospital. If, for some chance, you are all fine, then please come and, and work here so that you can help me minister to those that are not fine because they are many. And I hope going forward we will have 
in an environment that where it's safe and, and okay to say that I'm not fine. <clears throat> I will ask you for a little grace the next couple of weeks. I need to sleep a little bit after this experience. Lisa had to go to Hawaii unexpectedly. Her father was not doing well. He is doing better. She's not going to be back for a week at least. So I'm going to be a single dad for a week more at least. So I need some grace on that. And when she does get back, we're going to try to have some semblance of a vacation because we need a little break. So I'm going to be working this whole week. I'm just going to be working a reduced schedule. If it's something that can possibly wait a couple weeks, please wait a couple of weeks. If it's something that needs to be dealt with right now, I'll deal with it right now. But just a little bit of grace for the next couple of weeks while we, while my family navigates this. Um, I thought there was a possibility I was going to have to get on a plane to go to Hawaii. That's not going on right now. So thank, we are thankful for that. My father-in-law is doing much better. There are going to be two divine services this week. We're going to have paraclesis on Wednesday. I do paraclesis once a month because one of the things I confess that I don't do enough is pray for all of you by name. There are so many, and sometimes, and there's so many things that I neglect that. So once a month, I put this on the calendar for my sake so that I have to go to the altar. It's on my schedule to pray for everyone by name. And if there are additional names or needs that you need, you may bring them to the monthly paraclesis. Sometimes there's five people here, sometimes there's 20 people here, but it doesn't matter. As long as it's me and a chanter, I come for me because once a month I need to do this. We will also be having divine liturgy on Friday for the Feast of St. Paisios. St. Paisios was canonized as a saint in 2015. His sainthood is not even 10 years old. St. Paisios died in 1994 the year I graduated from college. That means if you're my age or, or older or even younger, that St. Paisios was walking the earth during your lifetime. That's kind of a cool thing. There are people who knew him there. We have pictures of him. We have writings of his. So I, we do the Feast of St. Paisios. There's a few new saints that we do. There, there are several, but I do a couple of them every year, and St. Paisios is one of them. He has kind of a great devotion, and it's good for us to understand that the saints are not just 1,500 years old, there's some that are, in this case, nine years old. And that's really, that's really cool. Um, Father John's going to have his normal Bible study on Monday night. And we will go from there. So thank you for being here today. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed week. So wonderful to see so many kids from camp here today. That really inspires me. Have a wonderful day.